was probably. We got Bayes philosophy here. See that? How many more people do we have? Do you guys log in? It's la there's a lag. Reboot like refresh. Okay. <laughs> refresh. Can you tell me if you can see it? Is it up? Yeah. They put an ad up there. Yeah. Okay. Um Welcome to ethics class, everybody. Um, today we're going to be going over, uh, I mean, you guys in the class already know, but for those in the chat, why can't I see the number from my, oh, 25. We're going to be going over. <laughs> Ethics, but uh, chapter six today. What's going on? I can't. Is it good? <laughs> Who's doing all the hearts? <laughs> <laughs> well, what did I tell you? If you look, we've got Spanish on all the, the boards, so I told you we'll be doing the stream in Spanish. I wish I <laughs> All right. Share screen. Where is my share screen? Okay, natural law. Black screen. Oh, I know what to do. Yeah, so you got to do this. I forgot about. Okay, got it. I don't know why it does that. Man, everybody's speaking Spanish today. This is crazy. <laughs> So we did morality and religion last. And now it connects to, there's a lot of connections to natural law. Anybody heard of natural law? The law of nature. So who could guess where does probably natural law derive from? Who's the first person that maybe put a theory of natural law? Anybody? I would suggest it's probably rooted in um, Aristotle, but it's Thomas Aquinas that really kind of develops a theory of natural law. Now, natural law is often misunderstood. So it's going to be an ethical system based off of nature. But that doesn't mean, I mean, that's kind of unclear, right? I mean, there's lots of stuff in nature, like animals are in nature. It's an ethical system after animals. They um, often kill and eat. Drunk. And we're back to Jeffrey Dahmer. The Jeffrey Dahmer test. And I've heard this say too, that like, well, you know, nature does, that. it's like, well, yeah, but you're not an animal. The idea is that nature, that things in nature have a nature. What would you say nature is? The nature of something. What's the nature of an orange tree? Grow into a tree and produce oranges. 
What's the nature of a triangle? Yes. So if if I did one of these, like, is that a good triangle? Why? Because it doesn't fulfill the nature. Now, is it morally bad? Should we lock it up in triangle prisons? Here's the triangle death penalty. You've been judged and found wanting the triangle, and you're now dead. You died. No, because obviously triangles don't have free will. It concerns, it implies a morality based on natures, and I'll share this screen. Here comes mods, watch out. There's things that are good and morally good, but I, I talked about, generally speaking, some things, it makes sense to say something's good if it's doing what it's supposed to be. And what's a triangle supposed to be being? Totally it's fun, huh? <laughs> Being in a triangle, why is that its nature? Okay, so something is good if its nature is fulfilled. Now, when it comes to what we say moral actors, that's you, you're a moral actor because you have the ability to do something, right? So with freedom comes moral responsibility. So now we've got a definition For natural law theory, somebody read it. Come on, volunteer once. Yes. Uh, actions are right just because they are natural and wrong just because they are unnatural. People are good or bad to the extent that they fulfill their true nature. Uh, the more they fulfill their creation, the better they are. Pretty straightforward. <clears throat> That's. The moral law is the natural law. So, obviously, that's a little bit different than the law of physics, right? And as I pointed out, we can talk about laws in different senses. What's the law of physics? <laughs> the law of the inverse square, inverse square, right? It describes reality. Is the way things are causally or uh, related to one another? So this is regularity, intelligibility, and that's what the universe is supposed to obey. Okay. And there's social law, right, and social sphere. What's that? What citizens, what they ought to. And then there's the moral law. Okay. It's not... Like physics, the laws of physics, because we're concerned with what? Actors who have free will. That's basically 
Natural law promises to explain how morality could be possibly be objective. Now we saw the class, we saw the from the classes on subjectivism and relativism all the problems. I forgot, just remember Jeffrey Dahmer. Moral relativism leads to Jeffrey Dahmerism. Um, so we saw why we would probably want to reject that unless you're a sociopath. Um, and even though it's under the guise of tolerance and freedom, it's a trick. First of all, it's logically contradictory. You know, we saw that. Um, it can't be carried out. And just because somebody says something is tolerant doesn't mean it really is. And I told you too, what's really interesting, even the notion of tolerant means already, I don't think most people think about this when they use it. It admits that something's wrong when you're tolerant. You might not be doing anything wrong. We're tolerating it. It's not how people usually use tolerance today. I mean, it's like, well, it's just as valid or equally true as something else. So we saw some reasons, obviously, to reject that and why even practically that would be devastating. And we want to get an objective. Imagine if like mathematics was like relative and subjective. Well, it just depends. This culture thinks this person thinks that this formula equals that. And who am I to say, don't we want to strive for objectivity in different disciplines? And so likewise, and we want to be able to find out if it's actually true. Because it makes us objectively better when we obtain that. And do those things because ultimately ethics in one sense there's different branches which provide us with a better life correct we don't objectively know how to get there we want to object the theory to get us there so this is what natural law is supposedly promising you it's an objective theory why it's based on objective facts in the world. That's what's promising. Questions? In other words, natural law theory promises to explain how morality must be rejected, that is, how moral standards depend on something other than human opinion. Okay. Any questions? I feel like you guys have questions. You guys have not questions. Maybe Stephen Reynolds had a pretty complex question. Um, where is that? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go up. Yeah, we'll see how you guys are gonna answer this. Could answer with another question. Oh man, there's a lot of. Well, I don't know. Does that relate to the class? Yeah. Um, think about it. <laughs> you are look at this hide user report. Yeah. And yeah, that, that's a can of worms. Uh, a weird phrase. That's a theological can of worms that I'm not willing to go into right now. Um, I don't mind taking once in a while a little deviation road tour talking about something orthodox. That's right. Because you answer that would take a whole series of classes. Which, interesting enough, I was before Lent teaching on Friday. In the chapel um, room, which is the best, do you know that's like the best lecture room that we have on campus? Anybody been to the chapel room? Uh, the chapel event in the wrong direction. You like the commercial with the bird? Remember? The pigeon? 
Um, all right, I have a question for you. It says, many natural law theories are theists. Who claim why? Why are, what's the connection between natural law and theism? What does that have to do with uh, natural law? Essentially, comes to natural law. Well, I'm confused. That was my understanding of it. Well, there's the dictates of God. We saw the youth for dilemma last class. But this is saying something different. If we go back, natural law theory says that an action is correct if and only if it fulfills the nature of something in objective reality, and bad if it doesn't. So that's more than just like a command or dictate by God, right? So keep going. You're on the right track. Just keep. Well, that would it have to do with the purpose of humanity overall? That's yeah, well, the, I guess you asked the question, where do the natures come from? Like what makes, what makes an orange tree be an orange tree? Oh, an orange tree? No, I wasn't talking about exactly an orange tree, but in general. Like um, well, that depends on if you're an evolutionist or non evolutionist. What type of evolutionist? Yeah, that some are going to say, like Aristotle is going to say, fix it in species. He means by that. Essences and natures don't change. So properties might change, but we can never get a species. That's an Aristotelian, which kind of makes sense that he was kind of a loose, uh, natural, like what would later become natural laws. Yes? It would be that God created nature, God is good, and there are in Genesis where it says this is good, and so the laws of nature, if they're yeah, isn't that interesting? So there's a connection between these words are called. Oh, I can't get out. Truth, being, goodness, beauty. Those are called transcendentals. And it turns out they're kind of interrelated and connected. So let's go back to what you were saying. What is being, truth, and goodness have? God creates the world to be a certain way. When he creates it, he creates being, correct? So I already have the word being, the concept of being. Then he says, it is good. Well, what is, okay, now tell me what does being have to do with goodness? Well, if we go back to our example of the orange tree, we can start with simpler examples that you would all agree with. And we would call an orange tree is a good orange tree if it's in a certain way. What way? It's Supposed to be. Traces the question. And how's that? It was created to be a nature, whatever the nature is. And so there's a goodness, being, and nature 
are connected. That's where your point was. And therefore, you can see how this would be really. Oh, okay. Well, because you can ask the question, you could say you accept. Okay, those essences are natures. An essence is what something is. What may, and then you ask the question, well, what makes it that way? Rando? Which brings up the question, it's like, well, they just change it. Like, I never know how something's supposed to be. What's normal and then never changing? And this kind of goes back to questions that I discussed in the introduction of philosophy class. If the world's constantly in flux, as some philosophers are saying, then it becomes an untellable, right? I mean, you can just think about Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, right? It's like this distinction to kind of madness and stuff like that, because what? Everything's out of proportion. It's like constantly changing, there's kind of a loss of self and identity, and all these kinds of things running through Lewis Carroll's. Obviously, he's picking up on kind of philosophical things. I mean, and to play those argues needs a standard, a rule. And rule works if you're gonna measure, can you imagine if like every time you got your rule up or something, like not only was the table like growing and shrinking, but so was the ruler. Like and then you realize you took drugs. Like, oh so drugs are bad. Because you can't build on drugs. Or you can't get hurt, right? Or you get some hurt, like <laughs> monstrosity. Because my ruler, nothing's, everything's changing. So I need this kind of standard or something that doesn't change. And then you get this kind of notion of intelligibility. Oh, I can change. Even a changing world, if I find something that doesn't change, I can measure. I can. So, but. Brings back to the question: well, What makes something be the way it is? In terms of permanence, is the standard? Because that's what we're looking at as a standard, right? In this we're looking at standard for morality. If you're going to base it on some objective reality, the objective reality you're not being plus too. It needs to be a standard. So this is what natural law is promising. And this is why there's often a connection with theism is that it can be like, well, that's the way God made it to be. God is good. He creates the world to be the way it is. We talked a little bit about this last class from the divine ideas. Orthodoxy, that's the logoi, the eternal. And orthodoxy there really is a divine logoi of tree. You know that? A triangle. Before any triangles and trees are created, it was a divine eternal idea. God called a thought will. Wills and moves through his thoughts. And when he speaks, right? The logo is a word. When he speaks, it comes into existence. And so that's why in the scriptures in Genesis says God's going to prove good. Because goodness is associated with his divine logoi. And so his life is the things in nature fulfill their nature when they're good. That's basically natural law. Any questions? Anybody read? Uh, it does say problem slot. That's orthodox church. Sure. So of course it is. Who else would be running Cyrillic in the chat? Okay, number two. <laughs> Share. <laughs> Thank you. 
Summarize natural law theory promises to explain how morality can possibly be objective. How moral standards depend on something other than human opinion. Morality depends on human nature, not human opinion. Moving on. Natural law easily explains why morality is specifically for human beings and not for anything else in the natural world. Why? Why would it do that? Because humans have reason and therefore we can understand what should be right or wrong. And then he, exactly, he makes a comment that like, animals might give a reason. Um, in basic ways, the point ten. There's a reason why they're not called irrational animals. You're one of this, or do you think that your animals are rational? My animals are because um, I've evolved them. Uh, I teach them logic. Like you'll see, my cats to distinguish between a valid and invalid argument. They know how to make that source of reasoning um, abstract to universals, right? Creates complex systems of equations and develop uh, philosophical theories, um, even theories about art. Do we do it? Isn't that awesome? No? Right, was, I'd say, okay, they reason at some level, but not rational, abstract, logical thought, abstract universals. Um, also, in conjunction with that, they operate in role world ways. Even though you have instinctual drives, you can do what? The animals can. Override it by what? That's why we tell you, like, we would think you're more like, you're acting like an animal. <laughs> right? That would be an example of a uh, Driving 200 miles per hour down the 200 with a uh, white claw. What was the other one? Fireball. 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 Okay. He's acting like a wild animal. You know better than that. Also, it demonstrates why we don't have. Else, right? Animals were really moral and rational agents. They could override their instincts and mainly, mainly that they have uh, some level of free will by the ability of rationality. And they would be going to talk to the Joe for who we want to the park of the law, right? You will, they won't. So there's a difference. All right. So maybe there's something really nice about, well, this explains it. Natural law talks about we have a unique nature. We're a moral agent. What is a moral agent? Moral agent. It's in your book. Why are cats and dogs not moral agents and you are? They bear us. You bear responsibility. There's something for your actions. 
What's the book say? Somebody read it. Somebody pull up the book and find page 77. Probably that moral meerkat. I refuted. I guess there's an animal that's a moral agent. <laughs> literally reasoning us in the chat right now. So I stand corrected. Ah, oh, you got me. Um, I don't know. Is a, a moral meerkat? You are a regular. He's a moral agent. He's a moral. Would that be irresponsible for me to do? Give an animal yeah. a wrench. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Ivan says natural law cannot be known through natural reason alone. Interesting. We'll get to that in a, a little bit. All right, get your book out, 77. Find the old grant word moral agent and read that to me. Austin has a good one. Austin says, because we're moving God's image and animals are. Agree or disagree? You can do a poll too on these things. Austin's referring to the passage in Genesis, let us make what in our image. God says, let us make meerkats in our image. No? <coughs> Should we vote? Your cat for yeah. all yay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All nay. One. One. <laughs> <laughs> Your cat, are you a regular? How regular are you? If I give you a wrench, do you have to be a regular? Do it. Yeah. Given autonomy to animals. <laughs> One wrench at a time. All right. Who volunteered to read? The definition of moral agency. Yes, go ahead. Those who bear responsibility for their actions and who are fit for praise or blame are those who can control their behavior through reason. Yeah. That's why it's not technically correct when I'm like, bad cat. By the way, I don't do, I don't scold my cats because they don't I'm not that actually do that. The thing well. Uh, so yeah. Is there any way you can bring up uh, um, self or uh, you got take this one That's that's it's so weirdly that like are you inside my head? <laughs> I was actually thinking about Eric Carmen like bad kitty. <laughs> He's always saying bad kitty. What? <laughs> you just, they're just messing. Um, anyways, um, there it is. It's exactly why you're considered a moral agent. Is you can use your reason to override your instincts, um, correct your behavior. Which is really interesting. Kind of goes contrary to a lot of stuff that you hear. Like, what do we always hear? Do whatever you want to do. Like, you should do whatever. Isn't that what we're always hearing the message out there? And Jeffrey Dahmer took it seriously. And Tiny Mustache Man did too. And who else? Ted Bundy. He's just having a good time. He's acting like an animal. He was, like he should have been able to use it. That's why he's responsible. Okay. Natural law. Yeah. What about 
like in the law, people have diminished mental diminished capacity. So, like you would say that some of those killers, like they were so messed up. Where is the other? No, in the law, um, basically. Is um, I mean, loss of determine. So, if you're so mentally challenged that you cannot determine right from wrong, law is not going to hold you. Um, or if you have some type of condition, that's what the insanity plea is. It's not mean that you're insane, it means at the time I was unable to tell the difference between right and wrong. Somebody explained it this way. If somebody says the devil told me to do it, they're going to jail. They said God told me to do it, they might not. What's the distinction? Well, if you said the devil, you already have a concept of right and wrong. So that's what it's looking at. It's looking at responsibility. Like, so with sociopathy, they know. They just don't care. That's... So they bear responsibility for, um, and it's pretty rare that you find somebody who's so mentally diminished, um, unable to actually, but that would be the condition. For reasons obstructed, does that mean you're not accountable to all Let me give you this a great example. Suppose somebody is like, oh man, you ever try PCP? Why drink and drive when you can smoke and fly, man? Oh, sweet. <laughs> and people, you know, be like, man, I've heard crazy stories about PCP. But smoking and flying does kind of sound fun to me, so. Next morning, you wake up and you're naked in a chicken coop. And it's a bunch of dead bodies now, all over the yard. And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> right? You have amnesia. You have no idea what happens. I lost my reason. What's going to happen to four of them? Yeah, there's a kind of, but you did something immoral that led to the losing of your reason. So, simply because you didn't know at the time, were you able to, was there a level of responsibility that it's like you should be Now you want to make a chicken coop, it's all around. Um, so you're going to jail. That's basically a good question. Um, but if you're born, let's say, with some kind of medical retardation, it's like obviously that's factor in law. And, um, that would become a determining factor. Okay, good questions. So only human beings could be moral agents. With the caveat that they're not mentally so mentally impaired, yeah. or they didn't cause a sort of kind of you know impairment like that. So natural law has a clear account of the origin of morality. Theory tells us that morality is only as old as human itself. Morality is the earliest days of mankind, but that isn't because morality depends on being a As so many people believe, rather, it is because morality depends on human nature. So, we're talking about what is it about human nature? And then again, make something a moral agent. Well, because you have what we talk about moral agency is part of your nature. And that's being endowed with reason and freedom of action, right? That you're not determined. 
And so that's, if that's in your nature, then to act reasonably. Oh, the other thing too, to act against your nature would be what? If you're a free moral agent, then to coerce or enslave somebody would be what? Wrong. How could you say that? Natural law theorists would have an answer, but well, it's because of your nature. Okay. No. What's wrong with the mic? It isn't that bad. But like I'll have to. Otherwise. A lapel mic? Yeah, I'll start a farm for that. I don't even know how that would hook up with this whole. You buy my coffee. It's there in the um, aisle. <laughs> Don't forget to send in your chats and your tips. Uh, that will help with my family. Um, natural law theory may also solve one of the hardest problems in ethics how to gain moral knowledge. Okay. There are many skeptical arguments. We'll try to hopes for moral wisdom, moral knowledge. One of them is David Hume. And let's look at Hume's argument. This is called, um, I listen to it, it's not that bad. Hold on a second. I wonder if we can increase. One, two, it's pretty low, huh? One, two, three. Should I just carry this around like this? <laughs> Is we're going to explore the ethics of my period. It's low. I don't know why it's doing that. So I'll just speak up louder. Louder! It's not working. <laughs> okay, moving to the next slide. According to natural law theory, we can acquire more knowledge by one determining what our human nature is and looking to see what our previous actions can fill up. Okay, well, let's look and see. What Hume's argument is. Hume's argument, skeptical knowledge, uh, moral knowledge. One, we can know only two sorts of claims. I feel like we've gone over this argument. Conceptual truths or empirical truths. Conceptual truths are all bachelors married. Married, sorry. Or um, the flag is no wind or something like that. Then, number two, moral claims are neither conceptual truths or not analytic, are they empirical. Therefore, we have We already discussed this, right, with the, the moral skepticism. So, it defines conceptual truth as one that can just be known by understanding it. Cube, all integers are even or all bachelors are unmarried heads. When I get if A is taller than B, then B is taller than C. Taller. See, all these are examples of what we call a priori. Empirical is what we call a posteriori. And that's like this house was built in 1964. It was raining in London in June 20, uh, 25, 2007. Etc. Okay, so why aren't moral claims conceptual? It's clear it's not. It's like I can't find the moral fact out there. 
in a Bunsen beaker doing a titration test or something like that. Uh, Irmar flask in a Bunsen. Uh, confused. It's like my when you confuse your idioms. It's not rocket surgery, guys. You can't shoot three horses in a barrel. Give me some other mixed idioms. Burn that bridge when you get to it. We'll burn that. That's enough. Um, uh, he says that the argument is we can wonder. If a moral claim was a conceptual claim, we can understand you still wonder if it's true. Whereas that's not the case, supposedly, with conceptual claims. I mean, I have my own critiques of self evidence, but just granted for now. Um, well, why aren't the empirical claims? Well, not the empirical truths. We don't discover them by means of our senses. Even though it was supporting reasons for thinking this, um, empirical knowledge tells us how to describe the world, and we can describe the world we talk about, it, right? This is the is off distinction. However, um, natural law claims to be able to overcome this human skeptical challenge. Why? Because it doesn't fit. He doesn't accept uh, a natural law. He's going to accept Hume's first premise. The knowledge is either of conceptual or empirical, that it has to fit into those two categories. And so what you get is kind of a third way between those. Nature is empirical, but it's not necessarily physical, it's intelligible. So there's kind of a bridge between the two realms. The problem with Hume is he was an empiricist. And he didn't think empiricist. He didn't believe that there were immaterial natures or forms out in the world. Are we talking about forms, material forms, essences? So in antiquity, specifically Plato, Aristotle, what makes something be what it is, a particular thing, was that the, the chat can't see because it's got a unless I do it. What is that? Triangle. Triangle. What makes it be that? Never thought about that? What makes it be a triangle? Okay, you just give me an idea. You give me a form. A triangle, an essence, a nature, is not the thing itself. But this is modeled. I have to have an idea or form or model to make this, right? So the idea of essentialism, real essentialism of uh, antiquity was, and by the way, you know that the ink, the material is not the same as this, right? So there's a distinction. Forms, are immaterial, and they make the matter, the blue ink, be what it is. In this case, a triangle. So then, again, according to a nature, the material essence, I can actually say if that's a good triangle or not, a good tree or not. But the moderns come along and they reject this. 
they abolish their materials. We don't believe it. So now you get this theory called empiricism, like David Hume. So, well, the only facts could be empirical, sensible facts, or a priori. Because what? He doesn't believe that there is this world here. Natural law can bridge that. Specifically because, and like an Aristotelian sense, like I said, ultimately, a lot of this is kind of goes back to Aristotle. The form of that tree, that immaterial nature, is inside that tree. You probably commonly know this is DNA, right? But that's the DNA formation. What makes all those carbon, hydrogen, oxygens linked together be that? And not uh, it's got a nature, it's got a form inside of it that's instructed. What if you're just made of carbon, hydrogen, right? What makes you different than a tree or an animal or a dog? Your nature, there's an immaterial form or soul. That's the natural law. So, now, the natural law movement has a way to get around humans. Yes. Like, no, I can answer that. They are, in some sense, empirical facts because the material is only true what it is in virtue of the immaterial nature. And guess what? I understand this. So conceptual. So do you see that the three, the two worlds, conceptual and empirical, are brought together by the immaterial nature? What makes this be what it is? This. What makes it be like this? It's the third way that solves any questions about that. So, anyways, that's just a point to how are we are time. 15 minutes. Okay, but I'm still wondering what is human nature? Have you ever wondered that? Sure, that answers a certain problem. Skeptical challenge. I still need to know what human nature is and how I get to know that, correct? What are the three things that are offered? What are possibilities? Human nature is animal nature. Human nature is what's innately human, or human nature is what all humans have. Okay, what's the problem? We've already done this. You have heard people actually say this. What's the problem with that? What does the author bring up? And why am I going to jail for pee pee poo poo on or eating my young or stuff that animals do? That's kind of what he brings up. So that doesn't be um, sufficient. What about human nature is what is innate? It's innate, what you get from birth. They are natural in the sense of being inborn, natural as opposed to being learned or acquired. From this is the old question: nature and nurture, and by nature, nature. But that's not going to suffice. Too, and you've heard this too. I was born this way. Ah, Jeffrey Dahmer. I was just born hungry to eat people. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that's his nature. Well, it can't simply be whatever you're born with, right? You know why? Why do we call? I made a joke. It was bad taste. My wife signed up for 23 and I'm like, thank God you didn't send it to 21 and because you might have got the results. You send it off. It says here, you are. Um, okay, not funny. I remember that one. But why do we say that having 21 chromosomes is fact? Why do we have disabilities? Why do we have a concept of disabilities? If somebody's just born that way. Obviously, this is an argument. Well, it can't simply human nature is whatever you're born with. As we're born with uh, some people are born with birth defects. So it can't be animal, it can't be. What's the third option? Human nature is what? Is what all humans have in common. Most common denominator. Anybody? What's the argument here? He says, first, there are no universal human traits. I think I agree. He says that. What's his? Oh, he doesn't defend it. Why might that actually be? He says that. I mean, why might that be a problem? There is no universal human trait. There's nothing that we all possess. No comment. What's the founding fathers? All what? Men are equal and endowed with the inalienable rights. No, actually, human. The class dismissed. We solved the problem. There is no human being growing. No, no, no. We have to take away. Why? Interesting enough, because they were natural laws. There is something innate to you in the way that it, it ought to be. So, Part of this is where it comes in out words. Well, it depends on what you mean and make. It's not simply because you're born this way that makes it a nature. But it pre exists as a nature in which, if I endowed you with a nature, you would have it innately. You see how this is kind of flipped? In which case, you might want to actually say, what well, would be universal? We have something by which we can pursue life, liberty, and eudaimonia, happiness, we already talked about happiness. But the founding fathers thought you had a physical being, not because it was accidental, but because right, it just happens to be what all have in common, or it happens to be what you were born with. But metaphysically prior. So uh, if I were you, I'd find what he says contentious. So if you don't think that we all keep the gains, then you might not, why is slavery bad? Why is enslavement recoursing the rain? Why is that bad? Maybe you have something that allows me to do that. 
you have something that's in your nature, the right life liberty. This, if I was a founding father, so are you life liberty in pursuit of the fulfillment of your nature? Then I don't see what the problem is, right? So if I were you, that's the objection I would raise against. That seems to be a universal trait. Second, though, he says, even if there are, they may have to provide moral guidance. Why? Well, he says, return to the case of the non-animals. Non-human animals. Think about their nature for instance. It's part of a nature to be alert for predators. Our tiger. You like mine? The prey on the path of the prey. Okay. That makes to grow antlers and to be long colored still. There are butts with only three legs. What? Hold on a minute. Call the president. There's a butt with only three. Have you? By the way, my neighbor has a dog with three legs. I purchased a fake coffee and I'm like, no, that's dog. Dogs aren't supposed to have three legs. We are. We got a three legged dog running around, pooping on the grass. See how it's all tying in now? I kind of feel bad for the little fellow. Now, why would I feel bad? He's supposed to have four. So I don't know if he has an objection. Yeah, I know some animals have three legs. But intuitively, it seems that I know the nature of the not to have an athletic table. And that's why I feel bad for it, right? I don't feel bad for snakes. Oh, poor dog. I don't have any legs, right? <laughs> well, it's the nature of not supposed to have legs, right? So I don't know that the best objection. Um, we're down to 18. What's the matter? What is everybody doing? We should have a lot. All right. Um, so, do you like his objections? I don't think it works. I think intuitively, yeah, I know, of course, some do, some don't. I know that somehow, and we always kind of operate on this intuitively. I know that. So how do how do I know that though? Well, it isn't. I think one of the critiques I have of him. It seems to me that uh, what's our boy's name, Lando Schaefer? Is that your author, Lando Schaefer? What did I always say? People always have prior presuppositions. And it contaminates the way they think about stuff. It seems to me that all the conclusions that he's come up with, they're kind of an empiricist assumption, presupposition. Why? If I was an empiricist, all I could know is from experience what nature is. But the problem, if that were true, he would be correct. Well, it can't be an animal, not uh, like non-humans. Well, it can't be, he would say what's innately human, because empirically, um, simply being born with something doesn't make it a right or part of the nature. And it wouldn't be what all have in common. Why? Because if I just had to collect a bunch of samples, all swans are white. That's not like, and that's what makes being a swan is being 
Right, and then you find a black swan or something like that. So I think part of his problem that he sets this up is almost kind of a straw man is because the empiricist. But what did I say? Forms, immaterial essences or natures are metaphysically prior. So you just think in terms of existence. Metaphysics is concerning existence or ontology. They're metaphysically prior to the individual material thing. What does that mean? The individual material thing is not what creates the nature. It's not, well, it's just what they all, the material things have in common. Rather, the nature is what makes the prior, what makes the material individual thing a tree, a forest, a and because there's going to be many different trees, they're all going to have look materially different. They're all going to have one thing common among the many, right? Namely, tree, just like triangles. Triangles can look different. Blue, red, large, small, isosceles, equilateral, right angle. Many different ones. What do they all have in common? Two side geometrical figure through some angles. That is metaphysically prior, and that's what allows me to be able to recognize and identify and even draw that. So I'm telling you, when you look through this stuff, you can start figuring out. I know what this guy is. The way that even if he tries to be unbiased, I think he does a pretty good job. For the most part, your presuppositions will always sneak in. I'm like, ah, he's an empiricist. He's a vegan too. I already picked out a few. Um, because he's already made some hints in there. He's incapable of hiding it. There's nobody that can be purely neutral. That's the fallacy of uh, pretended neutrality. Anyways, we'll pick up on this. Anybody, you guys want to say anything to the people in the chat or um, any questions before we depart? Nothing. Oh, hold on a second. Um, let me stop and then we'll record you on for that. No, it's not like this time. All right, bye, guys. Everybody in the stream, God bless you. And three, thank you for chiming in.